but can, not, can no. you just summarise very, very quickly, because I need to move on to the, to the next guest uh, today. Can you just summarise, Patrick, what is the meat of what Ben Fellows is, is talking about? The meat of what he's talking about is that, um, th that Jimmy Savile is just the tip of the iceberg. This is an institutional, systematic rot of filth that runs through the entertainment industry, particularly what he's talking about the BBC and his experiences there, but also his experiences as an underage um, uh, investigative guy on the Cook Report. What they did was the Cook Report hired Ben uh, as a 15 or 16-year-old to uh, go into Westminster as a, a sort of a little honey trap for some of these um, uh, politicians in Westminster who had a, um, uh, let's say, an interest in young boys. Um, and they were successful in, in luring some of these guys out. That's in the article. Some names are mentioned in there uh, regarding that story. And also um, at the BBC and also in the, in the entertainment and the musical world, uh, fake castings um, and also threats or, or offers from producers to say, look, if you, if you come and you do this with me, um, I'll make you a star and I'll give you the top part in this top production. Right. And that, that was dangled in front of him many times. Um, ben uh, was one of the lucky ones where he was able to wiggle out of countless situations um, but, and wasn't, uh, but, but very closely could have really been seriously abused on a few occasions, which he outlined in, the, in this article. Right, thank you very much for all of that, Patrick. Um, we're going to move on now to our next guest on the show. We'll just see whether he's available online. And this uh, is a very brave gentleman called Michael Murin. Um, and he's, um, he's uh, come onto the scene by uh, publishing a, uh, a report that links Jimmy Savile to the um, paedophile information exchange. And the significance of this move is, is that basically, or this information rather, the significance of this information is that this um, starts to show the scale of the Jimmy Savile affair. It's not just Jimmy Savile. We've now got links, as you've just heard, into the higher echelons of British uh, government and society. And now we're seeing the lobbying groups, uh, people who were lobbying that there should be no age of consent, that anything could go. It didn't matter how young the children were. Uh, and this really starts to open up um, the uh, debate and the investigation as to what was going inside the BBC. So, Michael, have we, have we got you on the phone today? Yes, you have, Brian. Okay. Yes, you have. Thank you very much. I'll just get Mike to put up a slide. I, I, I didn't receive the photo of you, but I'm going to put up a little shot of what I believe is part of Preston on screen. And I've right. also put up um, your email and uh, telephone number so that anybody with information can call you if they wish. Um, well, that's lovely. Okay. Now, I've also taken a quick shot of the press release that you've put, um, put forward. And I'll just read the meat of this. You've written to Lord Patton, chairman of the BBC Trust, and you've stated, um, I am placing this information before you in this open letter as I feel that the BBC, BBC should now in, uh, initiate a full investigation into these reports, suggesting that during the 1970s and the early 1980s, the BBC's editorial policy was influenced in favour of Pi, that's the paedophile information exchange. This alleged infiltration of the BBC by Pi might also explain how Savile was able to operate as a sexual predator during his extended tenure at the BBC without challenge and or prosecution. So um, there we are. Um, Michael, what would you like to tell us about uh, uh, the Savile case and what you know? Well, I think one of the things that your viewers ought to note um, is that an, an organization with the title the paedophile information exchange if you can get your head around that um, actually operated in this country publicly um, for 10 years between 1974 and 1984 now the organization, as I understand it, had a very, very um, influential mailing list and membership. 
and the information that I was given was that uh, I was given two names some years ago as to uh, members uh, of that organization. One name that was given to me was Jimmy Savile, and the other name was that of a iconic Labour politician who was a cabinet minister in the 70s and 80s. He's still alive, so I'm not going to give his name out on, on air today. But uh, it will be passed on to the police, who I believe already have it anyway. Um, the organization uh, was very, very influential. It was seeking, first of all, to reduce the age of consent to five. It was then, its ultimate objective was that of, uh, which is also in the Communist Party manifesto, which is to abolish the age of consent altogether. Uh, during its uh, uh, period of operation, it secured very significant support um, among politicians. And I believe I'm correct in saying that that support reached a point at which they they came very close to having enough support to actually consider tabling a private mem member's bill in the House of Commons to reduce the age of consent in this country to five. Right. And of course, we know that um, Harriet, Harriet Harman, when she was pre previously involved with the National Council for Civil Liberties, that's now the organisation run by Chakrabarti called Liberty. But Harriet Harman was campaigning for it to be acceptable for people to be able to take pornographic pictures of children. Yes, and I believe, uh, um, I, I correct in saying that the Pediophile Information Exchange was in fact affiliated to that organisation whilst Harriet Harman was involved in it. Uh, that's correct by the information that the UK column holds, and I believe that that, that fact has also been printed in... So, to so this goes to show just how influential this organisation was. Right. And, do, and still is. Okay. Would you go so far as to say that, that you actually think that the paedophile information exchange was a central part in forming BBC policy on... Uh, on the issue of um, sexuality and uh, sexual relations with children? Well, I have, I mean, my, I have to go on the information I received and how that information has been verified. Now, uh, the past investigations that I've run, um, every, uh, every piece of information that was subject to police investigation, every single report, uh, uh, was found to be valid, and um, most of them led to police prosecutions. So I have a track record on the provision of information. The When the Jimmy Savile um, thing broke, that told me that the information that Savile was involved uh, with the paedophile information exchange uh, is uh, probably going to be proved correct. And I have to go on from there to the, inf the other information I received, which was that the paedophile information exchange was deeply embedded in the BBC and that editorial policy was being manipulated in the, in the fact in that there appeared to be no effective... <coughs> um, investigative reporting by any um, BBC program like Panorama or anything like that uh, into the paedophile information exchange whilst it was operating. Right. So it seemed to have support within the BBC and that is my information, that it was very, very extensive within the BBC. That is why Savile was allowed to operate and that is why there was no effective investigation of the organisation by the country's main news agency. Right. Well, of course, I don't know whether you will have heard it, uh, Michael, but yesterday the UK Column Live broadcast an audio clip with Janet Street Porter talking 
And in that oh. clip, she was effectively chastising the BBC for having failed to take charge of this uh, 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 child abuse issue, the Savile issue, uh, failed to grip it uh, and fail, failing to manage it. It was an extraordinary admission. She was more concerned with the fact that the BBC weren't managing the case than, than saying, my goodness, we've got to get the BBC fully investigating this. So um, whatever her connections, if any, with, with the Savile case itself, her attitude seems to show that the BBC is embedded in this attitude of, of cover-up, and perhaps we're beginning to discover why. Well, I, I think that's quite right, and I think that what you will find is that there is going to be a, uh, a massive, um, and there is beginning to be a massive attempt to um, make sure that none of this sees, uh, sees much more of the light of day. Right. So uh, I, I'm not just asking for a, an inquiry by the BBC, because quite honestly, I don't trust the BBC to run an objective inquiry. What I'm seeking is broader than that, and I want to see the paedophile information exchange was eventually prosecuted in about 84, 85. I want to see all the um, evidence, documentation, uh, memos that must have gone between Scotland Yard, the Home Office, and 10 Downing Street related to that prosecution, I want to see those documents um, brought out into the open and published. Right. And, and presumably you would think the same about the other massive investigation into paedophiles that was Operation OR, which, uh, O-R-E, which um, Tony Blair put, put the, um, the gagging order on. Perhaps we're yes, I mean, I, I think, I, think I, I am only, uh, I'm focused on this link with uh, Savile and the paedophile information exchange, um, but I see it, um, I see it as the first objective, and I see it as, as, the, as the beginning of bringing this whole issue out into proper public scrutiny, and um, just establishing exactly what has gone on and the full extent of uh, the paedophile activity in this country. Right. Um, now, I'll just bring up on screen the address of Lord Patton, because I suspect that some of our viewers and listeners will also want to take follow-up action. Um, just as a final comment, and I'll be delighted to, to look into this matter with you in more detail another time, but just to um, finish, what would you like to see Lord Patton do, having received your uh, letter? Well, the first thing I want is I want a full uh, response from Lord Patton, and I would like that response to be, um, uh, yes, we will establish this as a separate inquiry to any other inquiry that they've already established. Right. Okay. Specifically focusing on the, the Pi links and the Pi influence over the BBC um, during the period 1974, 80, 84, 85. Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to thank you very much for giving us that very concise overview of what you've discovered. I know it takes a lot of courage to speak out on this matter. Um, we would like very much to stay in, in touch with you. And I think already we know we've got some interesting information to exchange. So thank you very much, Michael, for joining us. Thank you for having me on your programme, Brian. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, goodbye. Well, what an extraordinary uh, state of affairs that we've got in Britain today. We are now really starting to get in amongst the rot that clearly exists, not only in the political arena in Westminster, but of course thoroughly aided and abetted by the BBC. We know that on an in international scale, the BBC is not prepared to tell the truth about Libya or Syria or Iran or Afghanistan for that matter. Um, we have consistently seen the BBC let off the British government even when we're dealing with war crimes concerning Iraq and other countries. And now we find that embedded in the BBC 
is essentially a pro-paedophile agenda. And I think that uh, there is much to be done if we are to get the full truth out about the rot which really exists at the heart of our establishment.